Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And last week we had Diamond returning. This week we have Marvel Comics returning. So we finally have a proper stack of comic books to read and review and discuss. So here we go. Without much further ado, we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, Alienated number three. Really impressed with this book. Liking it a lot. Boom slowly checking back into publication as well. Alienated number three was the best issue of this series yet. I absolutely loved issue number one. I thought issue number two was pretty solid as well. But issue number three kicks that quality right back up and it delivers a very personal, nuanced, tragic, and human tale. Really like it. This is one of those books that focuses on young people, but it doesn't do it in an obnoxious CW way. It does it in a very real way. A very real way to, I'm sure, the youth of today, and of course to those of us who used to be youth back in the day, though a lot of us, like myself, are still very soulfully youthful. Anyway, Alienated number three was really great. You really get to Focus in on Samantha. Learn about her past, her history, her life. You get a little bit more of the unraveling of the mystery of what exactly is going on with this alien artifact creature that these three different Sams have found. And now they're all complicit in some kind of crazy, unique tragedy and they can all share the same headspace. Really interesting stuff. I like it a lot. Simon Spurrier, I'm not always the biggest fan of his work, though I did just recently reread The Dreaming in its entirety and was blown away. This book's blowing me away as well. Chris Wildgoose's artwork has got a great rough yet clean type style. It kind of captures both of that aspects. The dichotomous nature of that line work is absolutely fantastic. Andre May rounds out the creative team. Boom's just doing a hell of a job right now. Alienated's another one of those. We know that Boom's got the first look deal with Netflix right now, so Alienated's one of those ones that you might want to get into because it's a concept that is rife and ready to be adapted into a TV show or a movie or something like that. Alienated, super cool. Sci-fi, but it's the human drama and emotion that really capture and, and elevate this to the pick of the week. Alienated number three. Loved it. Also from Boom this week, we have King of Nowhere, number two. Um, so this is a story about this dude who wanders off into this place called Nowhere. There's all kinds of crazy, weird human-animal hybrids, like a fish-faced dude. There's like tree people. There's all kinds of crazy, weird fantasy-type stuff going on in there. And now he's just trying to make a go at it in Nowhere, right? But of course, there are outside forces that are... Definitely not going to allow that to happen. King of Nowhere is written by W. Maxwell Prince. So it's written by the cat that does Ice Cream Man. So if you like that one, you might want to check this one out. It's got artwork by Tyler and Hillary Jenkins. Tyler Jenkins did Grass Kings over at Boom Studios with Matt Kent. The artwork's really rough, really raw, very gritty and edgy. But it totally captures the insanity that's captured in the story. I really like it because something that could just be weird and quirky and oddball is definitely resonant, resonating with some really rich thematic stuff, right? And that's because of W. Maxwell Prince. He's able to take the absurd and the mundane and blend it together to, into an idea where it makes experience and emotion feel transcendental. Does that make sense? I don't even know. Anyway, King of Nowhere number two. If you liked issue number one, you're going to love issue number two. It really starts ironing some things out, starts setting some things up for the story, and it has me very excited to see where we're going. Boom's doing great. They're doing great with creator-owned material like that. They're doing great with licensed material. Power Rangers is back. Go, go, Power Rangers number 31, continuing the necessary evil story with a look back on what exactly caused Zack Trini and Jason to leave the Rangers right at the beginning of season two, or as I like to call it, the Thunderzord era. Um, this is really cool stuff. It fills in those holes for fans, but it's also Ryan Parrott, um, Cena Grace, and company, just like with the Mighty Morphin flagship title, they are delivering one of the absolute best superhero comic books on shelves right now. They're kicking Marvel and DC's ass right now at Power Rangers as far as just 
exhilarating superhero dynamic action that's colorful with lots of emotion and really well-grounded stories and characters as well as fantastical craziness. Go Go Power Rangers is doing it, doing it right alongside Mighty Morphin. I absolutely love it. This is Necessary Evil. It's a necessary superhero comic book, at least for me. We're building up to Mighty Morphin issue number 50 and a big giant reveal a big giant surprise that's going to launch the future of the Power Rangers franchise in comic book form from this point forward. Go Go Power Rangers is great. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think even if you're not a Power Rangers fan, you might like this book, for real. Because it's just such a great, kinetically charged, exuberantly fun superhero book that covers all the bases. Everything that Kid Robbie loved about superheroes is perfectly captured in the pages of a Power Rangers book right now. I would love to hear someone's opinion who's never watched Power Rangers, never been into it, to read the book and see what they think about it. So that's what I thought about the Boom Books this week. You know, Picks of the Week, great books. However, Marvel is back, so we got to celebrate it. Last week we had Diamond back. We've had DC back before that. And yeah, it felt great. But now with Marvel back to the swing of things, it feels like an even more real new comic book day. Venom number 25 is here. Donny Cates wrapping up the Venom Island story with Mark Bagley. You also got a nice little surprise at the end. David Michelini, Ron Lim doing a little um, a, a original OG Venom Island era story. So that's kind of fun and nifty. Um, but the finale of Venom Island was really, really cool. And basically what it is, is not only does it wrap up the Venom Island story in a very effective and cool way, but it also starts laying the seeds for the null event that we keep talking about. It starts laying the seeds into how this is going to start reverberating out through the Marvel Universe and how other characters are going to get involved. Mark Bagley doing some great work here, um, reminiscent of some of his work on Ultimate Spider-Man. I really feel like his style elevated when he did Ultimate Spider-Man back in the early 2000s. I really feel like you, you get some of that tone in this book, mostly maybe because it's some talking heads or something, but Donny Cates does a great job of the story, catching everybody up on what's going on and setting it forward into the Marvel Universe. Very excited. You get a little sneak peeks of some possible things to come involving the Null storyline and really wild, wacky stuff. Um, and I'm super cool with it. I loved Venom number 25. I thought it was rad. I thought it was super groovy and it's been a while, but I was able to jump right back into this. Um, some lasting ramifications from this story. Like I said, Mark Bagley, this is his best issue yet on the Venom Island series. I really liked it. I thought it was solid. I thought it was a great encapsulation of the entire run so far and setting it off into the future. I do want to point out that cover, by the way, that variant cover. I remember being on 90MF Comics on one of their comic book corner um, shows, and this was part of Stash or Trash, and I said Stash, and here it is now here in the Huntsville studio being stashed. Love that cover. Marauders number 10 is here. This is the first X-Men book to be released since the shutdown. Marauders number 10 did not disappoint. If you have been just itching to see the Marauders go to war, that happens in here and it's big and it's explosive and it's really nifty. You got some great bits in here with different characters. Um, some really cool stuff. The mystery is is starting to really heat up about what's going on with Kate Bishop. What's going on there? How are they going to resolve that? But otherwise, the biggest thing in this is that they find out a bunch of stuff about these companies, I mean, these countries that are that are going behind their back and they're taking Forge's um, mutant dampening technology and, and they're working together. And so the Marauders decide to ride out and man, this has some great moments, some great bits, great characters. I love Marauders. It's one of my favorite X-Men books, and I'm glad that it's back. Cannot wait for more. Black Widow number one. Black Widow number one was originally supposed to come out in May, and then it got delayed. Of course, the movie got delayed till November, so a lot of people have been thinking that the book is going to be delayed till November. And yo, I don't know what's up, but we got a very small handful of the variant editions of Black Widow number one. I don't know if this is part of their yo, we're back type thing or whatever. So you might want to be on the lookout for a small number of variant covers for Black Widow number one. I checked the Diamond site. It said it released this week. It said it was coming. I just couldn't find the main cover anywhere, but I did read it. It's okay. It's okay. It's not the greatest. It's not the greatest setup. 
if I want a Black Widow number one, I want it to just just grab me, pull me in, not do some kind of tricksy soap opery type trick. And that seems to be what it did. So I don't know if you're going to be able to find this one out there. I don't know why I got this. We weren't expecting it, but of course I had to read it. But Black Widow number one, Kelly Thompson, starting a new run. It's supposed to be timed with the movie release. Um, It's okay. We'll have to see where it goes. Star Wars Dr. Aphra number one is now available in print. It was released digitally May the 4th for Star Wars Day. I read it then and I hadn't read really any of the Aphra stuff since like the very beginning of her solo run. I loved her in Gillen's um, Darth Vader run. Loved the character there. But here, I feel like I was just lost way too much. Um, it felt like this shouldn't have been a number one. It didn't do a good job of being a number one to me as far as introducing a new reader to the concepts and to the characters and to the story and to the groove and the pace and the flow. Um, so I thought it was just okay. But if you have been following Dr. Affer, I think you'll still be pleased with that one. Avengers number 33 is here with a fantastic issue. Not only does it spotlight Moon Knight and start this Age of Khonshu story, but it really does some wild cool things. I don't really want to get too far into it. I don't want to spoil anything, but let's just say Moon Knight has something in mind. <laughs> Moon Knight, this is Do you think Moon Knight could take out some of the Avengers? Hmm? Hmm? What do you think? This move This book has got some great moments. I really like the spotlight on Moon Knight. It's tying back to the big mystery that Jason Aaron's been developing ever since Marvel Comics Legacy with the Avengers of 1 billion BC and the totems like the Iron Fist and the Ghost Rider and the Sorcerer Supreme and all that kind of stuff. Moon Knight now is getting thoroughly wrapped up and involved in all of that and really cool stuff. Very, very cool issue. I really like this one. Moon Knight fans, you definitely want to check it out. Avengers number 33. Jason Aaron's doing kind of a a bit inconsistent run on Avengers, but when it hits and it's fun, it's cool. And that's super cool. Amazing Spider-Man number 43. Nick Spencer just wraps up his best story that he's done on Amazing Spider-Man. I was about to give up on this book. It's hard for me to give up on Amazing Spider-Man just because it's a, it's a flagship title. I always want to follow the adventures of Spidey and see what's going on. Usually, no matter how bad it gets, I mean, I will leave. Don't, don't take me for granted, Marvel. I will drop Amazing Spider-Man. However... This last few issues have been amazing. The only problem with this one, and this wraps up this whole Gog story, which the last issue was like, whoa, blew me away, made me feel for this character. Um, the wrap-up is absolutely fantastic. The only bad thing I would say about this issue is that Ryan Otley's artwork all of a sudden just disappears, and then somebody else finishes the last few pages, and it just is such a big gear shift in style and tone. It just completely almost kind of lost me there. However, man, I, maybe it's just a page, too, actually. Because that last page, where, yeah, it's just, it's just like a page or so. It's literally just like one page. Maybe it's just an ink. There's something off about one page really threw me off. Anyway, it's like uh, the third or fourth to last page. You'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but Amazing Spider-Man 43 really wraps up this story in a very heartfelt, charm, heartfelt, charming, and touching way. And seriously, these last three issues of Amazing Spider-Man, uh, 41, 42, and 43, have been the best work Spencer's done on the title yet. Loved it. So that's what we got from Marvel. They released six books this week. Did I cover all six? Hey, I sure did. Look at that. Well, no, because Black Widow is not supposed to count. There's something else. Probably something I'm not reading, and I don't remember what it is right now. Let's jump over to DC. Black Label, Joe Hill's Hill House Comics, to be specific. Basket Full of Heads, number seven. This is the finale, the final issue of Joe Hill's Basket Full of Heads. Leo Max and Dave Stewart on the artwork. A very satisfying conclusion. It all is revealed. It comes to a great moment. What I've loved about Basket Full of Heads, all of the Hill House books have been genuinely good horror books. And they each kind of have their own style, their own approach. They're all very different, but they all fit together in the Hill House vein, right? But they're all very different. Basketful of Heads has been having so much fun with itself. Like, the book is absurd. The book is crazy and wild. It's a great mystery when you start putting everything together and the way it wraps up, humorous. It's and not in a bad way. Like, it, it, it's like a joke with a perfect punchline. Like a bad, tasteless joke with a perfect punchline. Basketful of Heads number seven was absolutely fantastic. I loved this final issue. It's a very strong series. It's a book that doesn't take itself too serious, 
but it is a serious book with serious ramifications for some of the characters who wind up maybe becoming heads in a basket. But I really did like this wrap up. Um, some twists, some turns, some things that were obvious, some things that were not obvious. The artwork was just fire throughout this entire series and I loved it and I really liked the wrap up. And this book was so much fun and so uproariously funny. I cannot believe it. You're laughing at stuff you shouldn't laugh at, but that's that's the genius of Joe Hill. Basketful of Heads number seven out this week, also from Hill House Comics, The Low Low Woods number five. The penultimate issue. Um, had to get that variant cover. Holy cow, that variant cover is nice. Who did that variant cover? It almost looks like Frizen, but I don't know if it is. Where does it say? Yes, it is Jenny Frizen. Look at that. Beautiful. The colors, everything works. Anyway, Low Low Woods has been one of those books that me and a bunch of other people out there... Um, have been kind of up and down on. I think I've been more for it than some of the other people. And in issue number five, everything gets explained. If you've been confused reading this book like I have, it all gets explained in this issue and it all makes sense. And it's really cool. And I liked it. I liked it a lot. I really like Danny's artwork. It's gritty. It's textured. You add in the sickly sweet colors of Tamra Bon Villain. Fantastic stuff. Carmen, what's her name? Carmen Maria Machado doing a great job with the story, building this mystery up, but it was hitting a point where it was just so weird and quirky and absurd and you couldn't really understand what was going on. So in issue number five, right before the finale, they just, it's all exposition pretty much, but it's such an engaging and enthralling and interesting story that I was completely sucked in and I loved it. Plus that cover, Lolo Woods number five, it's got my seal of approval. Flash number 754 is out. We're continuing this paradox story. It's a little bit, bittersweet reading Flash right now because we know Joshua Williamson's going to be wrapping up soon with the finish line story. But this is basically Barry and Eobard Thawne fighting, trying to stop Paradox. It's villain from the future, time-oriented. Really cool stuff here. Paradox is basically going through and trying to destroy every monumental moment in Barry Allen and the Flash's life. He's trying to destroy that legacy. The only person who can help Barry is the reverse Flash. And, of course, it doesn't quite work out the way they want. Like, what was Barry thinking? Does, was he thinking that he could work with Eobard and they wouldn't, like, butt heads or there wouldn't be conflict there? Of course there was, but that's why it's happening because that's what makes a great Flash comic book, right? But I'm really liking this book. I think Josh Williamson's just been killing it on Flash. He's had some moments where it dipped in quality, but it was always just for a little bit. It's always pulled itself right back up. And right now it's just trails just steaming right ahead to that finish. Flash number 754, I'm loving it. If you haven't been reading Joshua Williamson's Flash, you definitely need to. Justice League, number 45 is out this week. Um, I quit reading this book, then I got caught back up on it because, you know, there's not a lot of comic books coming out each week now. Um, but Justice League number 45 is okay. Robert Vendetti doing this, like, Spirit of Vengeance story with not Ghost Rider or Blaze or anything. It's the Spectre, right? And I would be really, really excited because I'm a big Spectre fan, but this book came across amateurish, cliche, boring, dull, at least to me. I don't know. It's really weird, too, because it's so cemented in current DC continuity. They're referencing Aquaman's new kid. They're they're referencing Superman revealing his identity. But, like, yo, what happened? Because at the end of the Snyder run, the Justice League went off, and then, like, Death Metal, is this supposed to take place after Death Metal? I don't know. I don't know. It's just a weird thing to place. It seems like they should have lined it up a little bit better or maybe the Justice League are missing and so there has to be a new Justice League team for them and they can carry on that because this isn't a solid, consistent run. Vendetti's just doing a few issues then Spurrier's coming on, I think. So it's just kind of fill-ins until, I guess, post-Death Metal and they get to reveal and unveil what they want to do now for the direction of Justice League. So I think it would have been a better approach during this time to have like a replacement Justice League team, like maybe Supergirl and Nightwing. I mean, they've done this before, James Robinson's short-lived run, um, which was not very good in my opinion. So it'd been cool to see like Tiny and step in. I know he's busy with Batman, but it'd be cool to see Williamson, somebody else just kind of step in with some of the secondary legacy characters and kind of just, you know, have it be in story that the Justice League are missing and then build up to death metal even more because it's weird to have a big build up to death metal and then it seems like everything's fine just normal just league adventures seems a little weird right aquaman number 59 is out this week it's not going to be available all over the place because 
DC's doing this thing. It seems like, unfortunately, some DC books are being shorted at Diamond, including the main cover for Aquaman number 59. That that Tyler Kirkham cover is pretty decent, though. I like it. Um, I'm really liking Aquaman. I think Kelly Sue doing a great job in Aquaman. It's not, like, as good as the Jeff Johns run. It's it's But it's it's kind of up there with, like, as exciting or as thrilling as as the Jeff Parker run or some other things like that, or it's better than the Dan Abnett stuff, at least in my opinion. No, we all got our own taste, but I'm liking it. I think it's cool. Right now, Aquaman just had a, a baby, Aqua Baby, and she's gone missing. She's gone missing. Who done it? What's the big mystery? You got all the Rose Gallery, and all the big ones. It's, it's Ocean Master and Black Manor. That's basically his Rose Gallery. Um, I mean, there are others, but that's, I mean, that's it. I mean, I like their use you got Ocean Master in here. You got some Jackson stuff in here. Aqualad, I love that character. I like the way Kelly Sue's been doing this book. I'm mean, having a lot of fun with it. Aquaman number 59. Out this week. DC 100 page giant. Or fighting forces. Um, the, the stories in this one are okay. They're all military related. It's appropriately enough. You know, it's Memorial Day weekend. Or week. Um, but uh, it's got an unknown soldier story. With a Mooningham on the artwork, which is cool. And Christopher Priest doing that story there's a batwoman story and i read this um on one of my dc i don't know if it was a i think it was one of the weekly comic book reviews when it was all digital or whatever but there also is that jim lee brad Meltzer um batman story it's in here so if you wanted to get that if you're a huge jim lee fan get it but to me it was just a little eh, it was okay it was okay this is just okay the Wonder Woman giant, though, has some really cool original stories at the very beginning. I've never really been the biggest fan of Jimmy Palamati and Amanda Connor when they're on a book working together, but I'm really liking their Wonder Woman stories right now. So initiative number four, it's great. Penguin comes up with this great idea. Apparently he read Acts of Vengeance at Marvel Comics because he goes, hey, we all keep getting our asses kicked. What if we just swapped heroes and, and like, instead of me going against Batman, I go against Wonder Woman or something like that. So Wonder Woman versus the Scarecrow, but it's a very touching, great story. Um, the Scarecrow bit, I mean, the, the big Acts of Vengeance ripoff kind of idea is, like, just, like, a side note. The real thing is, like, Diana's emotions and what she deals with, with maybe the passing of one of her old school friends, right? Because Wonder Woman's been around for a while, and she ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Anyway, Wonder Woman DC Giant number four is out this week. And now let's take a look at some other indie comics. From Aftershock, we have Dead Day number one, written by Ryan Parrott who's just killing it over Power Rangers right now. If you tire of hearing me gush about Power Rangers, I mean, it ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, Eugenia uh, Bornjakovic, uh, Yokov, I don't know. Dead Day number one was really cool. I liked it a lot. The premise of this is that one day, every so often, when the stars and the moon and all the mystical forces align, right, the dead will, or some dead, not all dead, but some dead will raise themselves, and it's become this, like, holiday-type event. And the people will go out, and they'll spend time with their loved ones. But then you also got a lot of, you know, not so nice dead people kind of coming back. So there's this weird sense of celebration and danger that's going on in the book. Um, but it's a really cool book. And it basically centers on this family. And in the family, you get the idea that this woman has a former lover, a former husband or something like that. This is a new husband she's with and previous husband has died. But on dead day, he's going to come back. So, she, you know, she's leaving her current dude with the kids so she can go out and chill with her 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 dead husband on dead day but there's a lot more to it and when you get to the end it kind of twists and turns it's really neat this is a very imaginative story and the way that it lays everything out for you is very expertly done the artwork is pretty solid i really did like it um I think the artwork's a little realistic, but it still has got that comic book feel. Um, I really like this book. I thought it was really cool. It hit me. It hit me good. And it, when I first read the solicitation, I was like, oh, okay, that could be decent. That could be cool. No, they really turned it into something neat. And of course, you got some people in society that aren't cool with the idea of Dead Day. And they think that it shouldn't be something celebrated. And then there's legitimate reason to be fearful for your safety and life on this day. Then you got people that just love it. Then you got people that are basically make their whole religion about this. So the world that's being built up, the society and how they, how they react and evolve to the idea of Dead Day. Really interesting stuff. Dead Day number one, that's from Aftershock. From Oni Press, we have Rogue Planet number one. Cullen Bunn, Annie McDonald, 
Nick Filardi. Um, I really like the artwork in this one. I like the idea of the story. Um, and it was good. It just didn't quite hit me with as much impact as I would have liked. But it is cool. Sci-fi horror. That's something Cullen Bunn does very well. But it's about a rogue planet. Rogue planet is a planet doesn't have a solar system, doesn't have other planets, doesn't have a sun that it that it rotates around. It's just out there in interstellar space, usually traveling around. So cut to a spaceship. It's actually a salvage ship. And they decide they're going to go to this rogue planet and they're going to land on it and see what they can salvage, right? Huh. Man, do they get more than they bargain for because there's something crazy, mysterious, and kooky, and spooky, and scary going on in this rogue planet. And I actually like some of the absurd, crazy, mind-boggling ideas. Like, I don't know, what if you got what if you got attacked by a giant intestine? I don't know. It was wild. It was weird. I really like McDonald's artwork. I feel like the grittiness really captures that sci-fi horror bleakness that's supposed to be captured and Cullen Bunn does a great job of setting the story up very briskly and just letting it go my only I just wanted a little bit more that's maybe I don't know if that's a fault but I want a little bit more and maybe that's a good thing a first issue should leave you wanting more but I thought it was pretty solid Rogue Planet if you like horror especially sci-fi horror definitely check that out from Image Comics we got Bog Bodies it's a graphic novel but it's not too thick it's not too big it's $12.99 this is written by Declan Chalvey with artwork by Gavin Fullerton uh, Rebecca Nolte on the coloring, Clayton Cowles on the lettering, an all-star creative team, a great, great crime book. Declan Shalvey is an artist and does an amazing job on books like Injection, his Moon Knight with Warren Ellis, um, but he's also a really good writer. He did a crime story a couple years ago called Savage Town. This is a great like spiritual successor to that. Bog Bodies was really cool, but it also has a tinge of mystery and horror in there as well great stuff if you like if you like like if you like blue collar crime stories definitely pick up bog bodies it's a it's 12.99 it's a graphic novel but it is very well done so superbly basically these two hitmen have to go take out one of their own and he runs away and it becomes this whole crazy thing in fact do you remember that that sopranos episode with the pine barons was it was it Polly and Christopher? They had to go and like kill that guy, and he, he runs away, and they have to chase him down. It's a little bit like that, um, but with its own spin and unique twist to it. And I really liked it. Bog Bard, Bog Bardies, Bog Bodies, is out this week. Farm Hand number fifteen is here. It wraps up the third story arc. We are now right dab in the middle of Farm Hand. It's going on a little bit of an extended hiatus after this one, but it's so that Rob Guillory and company can get caught back up and bring that energy for the final half of this series. What a slam bang fantastic issue. This book for 15 issues has kept me guessing. And now we've hit a point where we know a lot about a lot about this story. And it still has me so interested in what's to come. The characters have hit a certain point in their dynamic and their relationships with each other. The story has gone from just this weird quirky idea to a very serious rumination on science and faith and and just family and such a great job. Farmhand number 15, this book is amazing. It's basically about this dude, Jedediah, who creates or envisions the seed in which he can grow body parts as if vegetation. So bushes of eyes. Instead of flowers in the flower bed over there, you got ears growing and you can transplant them, but it starts going way crazy and way wrong. And there's a big mystery about where this idea comes from and how it reached its fru fruition. That is all revealed now. The villain is known. Everything is known. Relationships are broken. Things seem to be do like just like they can't get much worse, but they will. Farmhand is absolutely amazing. Rob Guillory is killing it on this book. Farmhand number 15. Speaking of Rob Guillory, he's got a few pages in here. Outer Darkness, Chew number two. I really like this one. I don't read Outer Darkness. I've never read Chew. And I'm loving this book. And that is a rare feat for a comic book to do. It's a crossover, right? It's a really interesting crossover too. So Outer Darkness is a sci-fi horror. And Chew is, you know, a comic book about this dude that eats things and he can kind of get like psychic vibes off him. So they need, on the Outer Darkness crew, they need someone with Chew's special abilities but nobody really exists in their world like that so they find out about this comic book and they use this crazy advanced technology to bring chew to life in their world but then he knows he's a comic book 
So does he really want to go along? Does he really just, because as soon as he's gone, he's going to be wiped from existence again. What a cool, nifty way. Tell a story. Gets a little meta. Um, really like it. Plus, Layman and Guillory kind of making fun of themselves. Afu Chan does most of the artwork. It got me really wanting to read Chu and Outer Darkness now, though. So, well played. Exorcisters number six is here. I remember reading this book. It's interesting. It's about these two sisters. One's kind of good. One's kind of bad. There's a lot more involved. I haven't seen it in a long time. Um, I was really surprised when I saw issue number six was coming out this week. So I picked it up. I was like, sure, it's been a while, but yeah, let's try it. Man, I know it's been a while, but I don't think I read issue five. I really don't. I was so lost, so confused about what was going on. I was like, I missed something. I think I may have only read the first three. I had to go back and check on the weekly comic book reviews and see what I actually read. Maybe I should get caught up and grab the trade paperback or something. But issue six was solid. It was cool. But I was just like, oh, man, I'm, I fooled myself. I think I stopped reading this one, man. I'm lost. <laughs> I'm lost. It's been a while, though. So if you liked Exor Sisters, hurrah, it's back. So there you go. Sarah and the Royal Stars, number seven, is here. I reviewed this on April 1st, uh, the very first digital-only weekly combo. Uh, uh, I'm glad that's all over. I'm glad we're back to that. A digital vault comic book is cool, but it doesn't smell. Uh, these are the best smell in comic books as well. Anyway, Sarah and the Royal Stars, number seven. Really great issue. This is a great story. Um, you hit some deep moments here. Um, some great moments that help um, turn the story into a bolder, fantastical direction, right? But if you like Sarah and the Royal Stars, you're going to like it. You can definitely check out more of my full thoughts on this book on April 1st, that weekly comic book review, because I did that right after I read it, so... Definitely cool stuff there. And Frankenstein Undone, issue number two. I'm so glad that two weeks into Diamond being back, I get a Mignola book, and that's just so exciting to me. Mike Mignola, Scott Ollie, Allie, and uh, Chris, uh, Ben, Chris? Ben Stenbeck. I absolutely love Stenbeck's artwork. He was the artist for the majority of the Baltimore series. This is Frankenstein. It says, from the pages of Hellboy. Frankenstein was briefly in a Hellboy comic one time, and that was cool. But this is a great Mignola Esque. It is Mignola. It's not Mignola-esque. It's Mignola. It's a Mignola sequel to the Frankenstein story. So it takes place after the book. Man, and this is so good. Great artwork. Just that great Mignola sense of creepiness, atmosphere, tone, pacing. Oh, loved it. Mignola fans rejoice. We got a comic and it's Frankenstein Undone. And I really think that outside of Hellboy... Um, at least in recent years, I think that the Frankenstein stuff has been some of the best Mignolaverse stuff out there. And I do got one digital book, because it's a digital only, that I want to talk about. And it is, let me find it, there it is, Youth Number 3. I've been following this one because I'm a big Kurt Pyers fan, and I also love what he's doing with Alex Diotto, D. Cunniff, and Micah Myers on Olympia. We're still waiting one issue for that, but Youth right now is a comicsology original weekly series about this group of kids out on the run, committing crimes, and they get superpowers. And so what if a bunch of, you know, no good kids who just or just like thieving, robbing, partying, right? What if they got powers, right? That, that this is what would happen in a way. Youth is great. The, 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 the emotions are real. The characters really resonate. Um, they're not necessarily good people, but none of us really are. And we all have something to relate to in this book about youthful regrets, youthful energy, youthful rebellion. And just imagine if you had superpowers. If I had superpowers in my late teens, early 20s, I may have been worse than what's in youth. Anyway, youth is absolutely fantastic. If you're signed up for Comixology, it's free. Otherwise, it's pretty cheap. But it's a weekly series that's going on right now. That's issue three. And I'm loving it. So if you like Olympia, if you like Kurt Pyers, you like his work, I highly suggest you check it out. So that's what I read this week. That's what I thought about it. I'm so glad that we got comic books back. Of course, next week, Marvel's not releasing any single issues. They're just releasing collected editions, graphic novels, things like that. They're going to be alternating that throughout June, and then they're getting back to the full swing of things. DC's ramping up their content next week. We're finally going to be getting Batman 92 very soon. Batman Adventures continue, and a whole lot more. So thank you guys for your patience during the, the shutdown. We, uh, we continued doing what we were doing here at PCP, and now we're back into the full swing of things, and we're very, very excited. Thank you so much for your support and your patience and for following along on this journey with us. We really do appreciate it. So there you go. What are you reading this week? What have you been reading? What are you excited about? Let us know in the comments 
down below. Thanks for checking out the video. Please do like, share, and subscribe. And join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts, blogs, and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Y'all keep on reading.